This episode is going to explore the first philosophers of the ancient Greeks. The philosophers that we will cover are Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. Together, they are referred to as the Miletians because they all came from the same city-state, Miletus, which is not in Greece, but Ionia. You may also hear these philosophers referred to as pre-Socratic philosophers. However, the term is used for any Greek philosopher who lived before Socrates, who was born around 469 BC. And although the first of the Milesians predated Socrates by about a century and a half, there are a number of other philosophers who also fall under this description. It is important to note that as philosophy was a new concept at that time, the pursuit itself was a broad one. These early philosophers could study a wide range of topics, astronomy, geography, physics, and the study of nature, to name just a few. Today, these would be considered subjects in their own right. It is also worth noting that the sources that have survived from pre-Socratic times often remain fragmentary. And so, scholars frequently find themselves relying on the works of later ancient Greek philosophers, such as Aristotle and Plato, to explain their theories in greater depth. The first of our philosophers was Thales, and he lived from around 624 to 545 BC in the city-state of Miletus. And by this time, the Greeks had set up colonies all around the Mediterranean. Miletus was one of these colonies. It straggled between the Greek world and the much older Middle Eastern civilizations. As a result, there was a mixing of ideas and concepts from both East and West. As well as this, there was a further exchange of culture in Miletus when traders arrived from all over the Mediterranean to buy and sell their goods. The region of Ionia was also politically turbulent, experiencing conflict between various factions, city-states and coming under the ever-expanding Persian Empire. Thales is regarded as the first of the ancient Greek philosophers. The ancient sources tell us that he was an important figure and there are a number of stories that give testament to his abilities. One account tells us that he accurately predicted the total eclipse of the sun on May the 28th 585 BC. Another account describes how he advised the Lydian king Croesus how his army could cross the Halys River by diverting it behind them and reducing its flow. Another story tells us Thales made an absolute fortune when he invested in the olive trade. The account tells us he predicted the year that the most profitable crop would be harvested. Some modern historians have argued that these stories should be taken with a pinch of salt. But what is clear is that Thales was regarded as one of the wisest men of his time. Thales attempted to answer a question that his successors would continue to debate. What is everything made of? The Milesians were monists. They believed that everything in the universe was made from the same stuff. A single element that they referred to as the Arche. However, what they couldn't agree on was exactly what the Arche was. As for Thales, he concluded that the Arche, this element that makes up all other things, was water. And so we ask ourselves, what might his reasoning have been? In order for the Arche to be the source of everything, Thales reasoned that it must explain life. He would have observed that water was clearly essential for living things to live and grow. Further still, we know that Thales saw the divine interwoven in everything and that he believed in souls. As well as that, a characteristic he attributed to the definition of having a soul was movement. Bearing this in mind, Thales would have observed the tides of the sea come in and out. Today, we know that the moon's gravity pulls the tides and that rivers always flow with gravity's pull. But gravity was an unknown concept in ancient times and to Thales, it must have seemed as if the seas and the rivers moved on their own accord. Therefore, Thales concluded that water must have had some degree of a soul and that it had the divine properties that he attributed to the Arche. And finally, for one element to be the source of all other things, it must have been capable of change. Thales would have observed that water could change into ice and vapour. Water's ability to change from a solid to a liquid and then into a gas and all the way back again in Thales' mind gave it the versatility it needed to change into all other things. 
Based on his own understanding, Thales theorized that the Earth itself was a flat body that floated on water. Our next philosopher was Anaximander. Again, from the city of Miletus, he was the first person we know of to attempt to draw a map of the entire world, which looked a little like this. Anaximander lived from about 610 to 546 BC and was a student of Thales. However, Anaximander's ideas differed somewhat. Anaximander did not agree that the Arche was water. He argued that it was something he referred to as the Epirion. So what was this Epirion? The word roughly translates to the infinite, the indefinite, or the unlimited. Anaximander's Epirion was the origin of all things, and the opposites separated from it, such as hot and cold, light and dark, until the universe was created. Anaximander's Epirion wasn't something that humans could touch or see, which leads to the philosophical question, what really is matter if it cannot be seen or touched in its pure state? Anaximander believed that eventually all things would return to its original state and become one with the Epirion once more. Anaximander had some other unique ideas. He believed the Earth was not round, but a cylindrical shape and that it did not rest on anything, but was simply held in place by its own accord. He proposed that the Earth was surrounded by hollow rings filled with fire, and that the sun, moon and stars were holes within these rings, which allowed us to see the fire within. This theory explained that the phases of the moon and the solar eclipse were these holes simply opening and closing in a continuous cycle. Anaximander came up with another interesting concept. He believed that the surface of the Earth was originally covered in water and that long exposure to the sun had dried the Earth for land to appear. Because of this, he reasoned humans were descended from fish-like creatures. A pre-Darwin evolutionary concept, maybe? Our third philosopher, again from Miletus, was Anaximenes. He lived from around 586 to 526 BC and was probably another student of Thales and Anaximenes had his own unique theories. On the question of what is the Arche, Anaximenes theorized it was air. His reasoning? To begin with, the divine properties that Thales had attributed to the Arche and concluded was water, Eximenes also used and believed that air was a more suitable candidate. For example, air has life-giving properties. You can last a lot longer without water than air. Also, it seemed to move on its own accord, a quality that Thales assigned to possessing a soul, and therefore the divine properties he also attributed to the Arche. However, Exemenes went further. He provided a mechanism to explain how it all worked. Anaximenes observed that water droplets can form seemingly out of thin air. Today we call this condensation and we know that it is actually the moisture or vapour in the air and not the air itself. Not understanding this, Exemenes reasoned that it was the air itself condensing into water and therefore he concluded that everything was indeed air in various degrees of densities. In his view, air was observed in the wind and in your breath. As it condensed, it turned into cloud, then water, then earth and other materials, and eventually stone. Based on this principle, Exemini saw the world as a flat, thin disk floating on air, like a leaf held in the breeze. He theorized that the sun, the moon, and the stars had evaporated from the earth. The higher they got, the less dense they became, as they turned into fiery objects. The ancient Greeks saw the world around them through the lens of their myths and religion. For them, it was the titan Atlas who held up the world on his broad shoulders. But the Milesians challenged this view. They attempted to explain the world through critical thinking and observation. And although our modern understanding has proven them mostly wrong, their legacy lies not in the answers they came up with, but the questions they asked and the concept of rational thought. Thank you for watching, and if you like my content, don't forget to leave a comment, like, share, and subscribe. Have a great day.